thanks everybody and I will be the official timekeeper and all that good stuff. All right. Um, let me just say that as a total data nerd myself, being, you know, I'm Valerie Hudson, I'm one of the founders of the Women's Stats Project and I live and breathe data on women every day. <laughs> and uh, uh, I have heard the calls, we need more data, we need more data. But I think what we need is a smarter approach to data. And I think there's some data that we haven't been collecting, which these uh, scholars are collecting, that is extremely important for, for moving the women, peace, and security agenda forward. So let me just introduce them in the order that they'll be going. Um, I want you to know that it took me six years to be sitting in the same room as two colleagues who are one floor up from me, which tells you something about academic siloing, right? which is really pathetic. So uh, I use this as an excuse to actually get to know uh, Michelle and Maria uh, better. So Michelle Taylor Robinson is Professor of Political Science at Texas A&M. She's currently working on a project with funding from the NSF to study mass public attitudes about women as leaders. I think that's what we'll be hearing about. And much of her research is on representation of women in executive and legislative branches of government. She's the author or co-author of books published with Oxford, Penn State, University of Pittsburgh Press, and has published articles in a wide range of, of uh, journals. And then um, Maria Escobar Lemon, just move over here, is Professor of Political Science and Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Education in the College of Liberal Arts. My sympathy. I'm excited. <laughs> and she studies political institutions in Latin America, particularly the way democratic institutions affect how citizens are represented in and interact with government. Her work emphasizes the representation of women, and her publications include, with Michelle Taylor Robinson, Women in Presidential Cabinets, uh, as well as articles in a variety of very good journals. Uh, and I think she's going to be uh, speaking, at least in part, about her NSF-funded work on women on high courts. And I want to just give you a big round of applause for that, my dear, because um, I have gone looking for data. <laughs> on women on high courts, and there was none to be yep. found. So you are definitely filling in a gap there. And last but not least, uh, Natalie Wright Will Mary Lewis uh, is a JD lawyer in law, and she has worked in judicial chambers and NGOs. Uh, and she is um, focused uh, these days on transitional justice and data surrounding transitional justice and women, peace, and security. Uh, and she is teaching international development at Brigham Young University. Uh, and she's going to talk to us about a uh, data set that uh, she's looked at in terms of uh, transitional uh, justice. And I understand that the government of Colombia is utilizing her data in the post-conflict uh, scenarios. Uh, so without further ado, Professor Taylor Robinson, you lead us off. And I will wave at you when you've got two Just minutes. Slide. So I do, like many others, want to start by saying thank you for this opportunity. This has been an absolutely fascinating, engaging day. Thank you to all of you all for your fantastic presentations. Thank you to Valerie and to the Bush School for making this possible. It's really very exciting. So this is not the title of my talk. It's what I want you to think about. Picture a leader in your mind. Is she a woman? Now, I can't take credit for that title. That was the title of a New York Times article in March. Um, people were asked to draw a leader. Most people drew a man. It didn't matter if the person asking the question was a woman or a man. And so I think that sets the scene for what I want to talk to you about, which is gender and leadership templates, findings from a multi-country experiment that I'm working on with my co-PI and colleague in my department, um, Dr. Nehemia Geva. And we're exploring how people evaluate female and male candidates across different levels of posts and across different policy areas. And we're curious if attitudes vary with the type of office um, you're asking about an, an individual, in our case, a female individual holding, or across different types of policy areas. And I'm going to present you a little bit of data about the security policy area, because that's the one that seems germane, of course, for this conference. 
So our real question is who holds gender neutral leadership templates? And who holds traditional leadership templates, which are that leaders are male? Because throughout human history, leaders have been male with rare exceptions otherwise. People have mental templates of lots of things about who fits many types of jobs. So if I say doctor, an image undoubtedly pops up in your mind. If I say nurse, an image pops up in your mind. If I say coach, if I say teacher, if I say president, that mental image is going to influence how, we're, how we will evaluate people. So the traditional poli politician came with a male and a masculine template. And that could be a factor that keeps women out of government, that makes women willing, excuse me, that makes women unwilling to run, that makes parties unwilling to give their support to women as candidates, or that makes voters unwilling to vote for women because they just don't fit the image that pops up in their mind. Um, so obviously this is about gender stereotypes, and what we're interested in is do they affect where female politicians are viewed to be competent? And we think this is an important question because even if women are starting to make it into office in greater numbers, if women are only viewed as capable of holding, um, of working on a small set of issues, albeit important issues like education or healthcare or women's issues, whatever exactly that means, that means that women are left out of all the other policy areas in government. And as Jamie Doby said this morning, all those issues are of interest to women. And particularly in this room, security is very much of interest to women, and that is the most masculinized policy issue, at least in findings of studies that have been done in the United States. So research in social psychology is very clear. People have mental templates of all sorts of things. But social psychology literature about role congruity theory also teaches us that people's images can change, particularly with experience, in this case, experience seeing women holding positions in government, particularly recent experience. So we are expecting that attitudes will be more gender neutral in countries where there are more women in government, because that just is going to change people's idea that pops into their head when you say politician. But in addition, Nehemi and I are expecting that your country context matters. If the major issues on the government's policy agenda are feminine stereotyped friendly, for example, if we're really concerned about health care, if we're really concerned about education, that may facilitate this idea that women are politicians. On the other hand, if the major issues facing the country are war, security, um, economic issues, those may be particularly um, female unfriendly issues, and it may make it more difficult to change leadership templates. And then just to save time, I'm not going to go into it right now, but of course there are also individual experiences that would vary within country that could change templates. So what we're doing is an experiment. So we're creating our own data, which uh, with all the data complaints um, everybody knows about. So in some ways this is easier. I'm going to set up a scenario and see what people react to. Now the advantage to an experiment with what we're studying is if you ask people in a survey, do you think women are as good at politics as men? Well, we all know that the politically correct answer to that question is yes, women are just as capable as men. But then that would not explain the election results that we see in a lot of countries around the world. So in our experiment, people don't know that what we're really interested in is the female candidate treatment. And so what we have is a parallel experiment that we're conducting in eight countries. We've completed the study in all but the last one, which is Chile. We're almost done there. So we have a total of 10 cases. I'll show you about that in a minute. It's a two by two by two by design. Our three factors are the sex of the candidate. So we have a speech by a woman. We have a speech by a man. They're identical. Um, the two major parties in a country, so one speech is for the party that's the governing party, one speech is the major opposition party, and then our third treatment is whether the party name is labeled on the speech or not. That's not particularly interesting in the United States where there are only two parties, but in Israel or Sweden where there's lots of parties, um, this was a way to handle that. Um, we're largely replicating a study done by Rick Matlin in 1991 in Norway, so I want to give him credit for the original idea. Students are randomly assigned to one of these eight treatments. And I want to emphasize that we conducted this study in all but one case in classrooms, which means that we have a much larger percentage of people being willing to take part in the study, which gives us a much more diverse um, subject audience than you would often get in experimental studies. Our treatment is a fairly lengthy speech, five to 600 words, depending on how wordy a language is. Started out by a, a short paragraph, the background of this candidate that's built on the standard background of sitting members of parliament. And that little background paragraph is largely to say he, 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 she, 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 multiple times to, to drive home that treatment. 
The speeches are based on excerpts of actual speeches by the two major parties. So for example, in the United States, the Democrat speech reads like a Democrat policy issue speech. The Republican speech reads like a Republican speech. So we're interested in people's reaction to the sex of the candidate. Our baseline control to which we can compare that reaction is people's reaction to party because we know people care about party in politics. So just a cartoon of the three cuts. So half of the people in our study in each location have a female candidate, half have a male candidate, half have the governing party, half have the major opposition party, half get a labeled speech, half get an unlabeled speech. And those are sort of example cartoons of what it looks like on the page. So our protocol, first we had to get ethics approval at A&M, then we have to get ethics approval in country, then we have to get school authorization, then we have to get teacher authorization, then we have to get participant authorization. Then they read the speech, we hope, then they answer the survey, and then we do a debrief. So our countries, you can see them in green. Um, we were choosing countries, they're all advanced democracies, not exactly all industrialized democracies. We wanted to hold democracy constant so that people aren't bickering about the rules of the game because we know that women often play an important role in democratic transitions but are then left out once the new government's installed. So we were looking for countries across three different categories. One is some countries with a lot of women in government, some like the US with not so many women in government. We also wanted to vary how elections are held, you know, what kinds of election rules. Um, and then also the, the dominant policy issues of the day, basically some countries that are sort of social welfare heavy in their, their dominant agenda, other countries that are much more defense oriented. So right now we have about 6,200 people in the data set. We should be close to 7,000 when we're done in Chile. Um, we, and um, Valerie asked us to talk about the challenges of data collection. I think she gave me permission to whine. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to do that briefly. I really liked the comment earlier today about if you had unlimited amounts of money for your research and a magic wand. I think getting money from NSF was easier. I really, I'd go for the magic wand. Um, and not that NSF money is easy to get. But so what are the challenges? I mean, the advantage to collecting my own data uh, creating my own data is it solves the problem of data unavailability, but then there are other challenges that you face. Now getting, you have to get IRB approval to in, engage with human subjects. Um, some of our subjects are under age 18. That's, that's pretty straightforward. That law is pretty clear. But then we had to get parallel approval in the other seven countries as well. And so in the US, we care about not getting sued. In Canada, the law is identical. They actually care about protecting the participants. <laughs> You don't fill out the paperwork the same way if that's the difference across the goals. You get ethics approval, you don't have any subjects. You've got to get school principals to let you in. You've got to get faculty to let you in. Generally, the students were pretty cool about participating, actually, because we were in classrooms. So they're like, hey, you know, I'm here anyway, not particularly a problem. Amazingly, they have paid attention. We can see this because we do this study with paper and pencil, so we can see they've written on the speech, they've underlined, they write commentary on the survey. So that's actually really cool. So in, in my, one of my big concerns was would anybody read the speech to begin with? That actually hasn't been such a big problem. Interesting problems with the world getting in the way. We got snowed out in Canada. <laughs> A teacher's, a university teacher's strike in England made it take six months to get the data in England. Uh, student strikes delayed us in Chile, and what were they striking about? Okay. Women's equality in education. It's like, <laughs> well, that might slightly contaminate our study, but people are interested. We've had good turnout in Chile, incidentally. Um, so there's challenges like that, and of course we want to act quickly because we don't want the real world to intervene and change something that would cause an interrupt in our experiment. Um, okay. Another challenge that we faced is we would like equal numbers of men and women in our study. Well, that depends on what classes we get into. Psychology classes were easier to get into in England. More girls than boys take psychology. So there are challenges like that. Another challenge that we face is, and I know you can't read this, but security doesn't mean the same thing to parties across all eight of our countries. It ranges from fighting narco traffic to better security on the streets, to defending Israel's borders, to commitments to UN peacekeeping, to know we need to be in the international coalition air bombing in Northern Syria, to narco trafficking, to improving police tra 
training, to participating in international peacekeeping forces, to having the best trained military in the world. So even though security was a paragraph in every one of our speeches, it doesn't mean the same thing in the political campaigns in all of our countries. So there is a slight problem that we're not necessarily measuring the same thing. So very quickly, these are ANOVA results for 10 cases. Pink bar is female, blue bar is male. And one thing that I know doesn't jump out of here, but in seven of the nine cases presented here, there is no statistically significant difference in the evaluation of the male candidate or the female candidate to be a member of Congress or Parliament. Yay, we are seeing evidence of gender neutrality. And we believe these results because across every single case, party is significant. So we know the experiment works. They got the treatment. They're just not reacting to sex of candidate. But if you look at Uruguay, they prefer the female can Low bars, by the way, are good. If you look at Uruguay, there is a preference for the female candidate. And if you look at Israel, there's a strongly more favorable evaluation for the male candidate. So quickly, because I'm going to run out of time, what about security policy? Because if women can get into parliament or Congress, well, that's nice. But are they considered to be competent to work on security? Well, and what we see here is that in six of our nine cases, again, we see gender neutral results. There's no statistically significant difference in the mean evaluation of the male candidate for the female candidate. This could partly be because of how security is defined. I've tried to array the cases from sort of the, the least military, Costa Rica doesn't even have a military, to Israel, where obviously defensive borders is a very strong issue. And you see in Israel, there is a strong preference for the male candidate. Again, low bars are good. Interestingly, in Texas, you see a preference for the male candidate, but not in California. The speech was identical across the two US cases. And then in Alberta, you see a preference for the female candidate. I would like my Canada experts to give me an explanation as to why. Now, I can tell you that in the other, most of the other cases, party is significant. And then lastly, just to give you some food for thought, well, we'll go here. This is just the male participants. If you notice in Texas, now we're gender neutral. The boys don't seem to care if it's a male or a female candidate. Everything else looks the same when we look at female participants. But in Texas, this is where we're seeing the preference for the male candidate. We're still wallowing in data. I can't actually give you an answer behind that. But I think that's interesting. But I think the, the happy take home, I'm just going to go away from that, is that Young people, our average participant is a high school senior or a college freshman, are exhibiting gender neutral attitudes. That's across 18 DVs. I think this is a sign of hope. If parties want to continue to tell us that they're not going to nominate women because voters won't vote for women, I can't say. For people my age, that might be true. But for the young people in our study, with rare exceptions, they seem to be concerned about party, but not about the sex of the candidate. And I think that's a happy result. Thank you very much. That was great. Woo! Okay, I promise I'm going to come back to that. Um, thank you. That Valerie, thank you, Bush School, for having us. Um, it's rare that I actually get to talk to people who are actually going to work and make a difference on these issues, so I'm super <laughs> excited. Um, I, I feel like sometimes I'm in my little bubble, and like the 12 people who care about this besides me read this. And I'm super excited about it, and my family's heard way more than they care to about it. Um, but it's nice to actually talk to people who maybe will do something with my data, so I'm super excited. Um, I skipped over the slides from the court's book. If I have time, I'll talk about that. But I want to talk about, or excuse me, the Cavus book, but I want to talk about the High Court Project. Um, so I set out to collect this data. Um, I thought this would be straightforward data. <laughs> oh my gosh, was I super ignorant. So were the three other awesome women on the project with me. We all thought, this will be fun. We'll work together. We'll collect this data. It'll be easy. We, budgeted, we got NSF money to fund graduate students to collect data on the gender composition of high courts around the world. We hired a bunch of, our, of uh, graduate research assistants. We hired a bunch of language-specific undergraduates, because if you only need some, just for some of these languages, we just needed someone to work for 20 hours on a particular language. And we didn't count on having a graduate student who spoke Icelandic or uh, Albanian in any given year. So we just were like, we'll just go out and hire international students as a piecemeal project. Um, and we thought, oh, a year to collect this data. 
two years later, we were still cleaning the data we got, realizing that we had really large gaps, um, but we've made tremendous progress. And so we are now at the stage where I have felt the data is clean enough that we are able, we are sending out academic manuscripts on it, and the intention is we are going to, we are going to make the data public. Um, had APSR accepted my paper this summer, the data would be public. Um, what we were collecting was two things. The first was compositional data on 265 courts, and our target was to get every country in the world. Then it became every country with a population over 200,000. And then it became, well, every country that doesn't have some kind of unique legal constraint, um, because I learned a lot about legal systems along the way, including that some countries don't actually have a high court. There's a whole set of Caribbean nations where they report to the final court of appeal is, was initially supposed to be the Caribbean Court of Justice, but then is still the Privy Council, the British High Court. Like, what the heck do we do with that? So we have a couple that are tossed out. So at present, I have 265 courts in 170 countries. And let me explain how I get that. Um, one of the other problems we confronted was what defines a high court. Some countries like the United States are really straightforward. We have one Supreme Court. It has power of judicial review. It is also the final court of criminal appeal. Really nice, simple, one court. Um, then we have this whole set of civil law systems that have, at a minimum, a constitutional tribunal. That's where judicial review is vested. And then there's a separate final court of appeals. We have others where there's a third body that's the Supreme Administrative Tribunal of Justice. It's this council of state modeled on the French system. Um, and then we don't get even to get into countries that have a supreme military tribunal and a supreme elections court. So we have this complicated structure. Um, and what we ended up collecting was the most comparable was where you have only one court like the US, that's your high court. Where you have a high, uh, constitutional court and a final court of appeals, which we call the court of appeals, even regardless of what the country has named it. Um, those are what we're collecting. And that's how I get more courts than countries. We also thought it would be really interesting to look at when does the first woman get elected. And this was one of the super surprising things. Um, so we've we managed to, in 100, for 159 courts, verify when the first woman was actually appointed in that country. Um, and as the slide says, this data is supposed to get that you think. Um, so to tease my data a little bit in terms of what I've got. Um, this map shows how long since women have first joined the high court. And so for a bunch of countries, we are able to definitively say, hey, there's no women on them. There's, no whip. there's never been a woman. There's not a woman now. Um, those are the countries that appear in black. There's a handful of countries that are white where despite best efforts, we think there's been a woman at some point, but we can't quite confirm when. Or the country has two courts, and we can confirm when the first woman was appointed to one, but the other court, we have no confirmation whether there was or was not. Um, and so those, the white ones are really are, the, are mi really literally missing data for some reason. Um, but this shows some really interesting variation. And we highlight the fact that the first woman um, is appointed in France in 1946. Um, but then we have a whole host of other of what I would call the sort of usual suspect places. So we, we get usual suspect places. Scandinavia goes early. And then we have Britain. That's 2005 when the first female law lord takes her seat. 2005. Oh um, yes. Um, and then we have Colombia, which actually goes earlier than the United States. I was very excited about that with Fernando Chavez. Um, so we have some of these cases here. Um, and this tells us sort of some general patterns. And I think one of the interesting things that really comes out of this, and one of my takeaways for this, is women's representation in the judicial branch isn't being led by, as I would say, the usual suspects. It's not being led by the places you'd expect it to be. Um, the second piece relates to this overall trend in time. And so what you can see here is from our data, um, the uh, your right hand uh, y-axis is going to be the number of courts we're counting. So that rises over time. That's the blue line. But even when I break it out across these different types of courts and the overall bar, which is the overall bar is this uh, black and white zebra line, um, we still see this percentage rising. And so one takeaway here is like, oh, yay, women's participation is rising over time across the board. And it's tapping out just over 20% globally. Not so cool. 
Um, and so we, we, we can show you that women's representation on courts is rising. Um, we can also show you some variation across region that some of those gains are coming places you'd expect. Again, my Scandinavia line, that bright blue line up at the top really indicating there's where there's a lot of women's representation increasing. Um, but we're also seeing some big surges in places you might not expect. Um, Latin America and um, the, so we've got Scandinavia sort of doing the best. Then we have these, uh, this is the West, not Scandinavia. That's the rest of um, Western Europe, United States, Australia, um, New Zealand. And then we have some of these other instances where women are doing quite well. Latin America and the Caribbean is one place where we've seen some significant, advance, some significant advances. Um, we've also seen some significant advances in Sub-Saharan Africa. One of the pieces that Alice and I are currently working on with this is in both regions we have constitutional courts that are created in the 1990s out of whole cloth, where the country revises its constitution, revises its judicial structure, and they're not just replacing a judge. There's this conscious decision of, we've got to compose an entire bench all at once. And so in South Africa, Alice found that one of the big discussions was not about gender, but race was hugely important, was that this court cannot be all white. Um, but that's in many of those cases, that's where we actually see bunches of women appointed because, and, and our, our hypothesis, this is something we're still gonna play with in the data, is that this is because when you have, to, when you have nine or 12 or 15 seats, it's easier to think about what representation look like, looks like than it's like, well, we have one person to replace and we were balancing all these other things, so maybe gender's not the most important piece here because this is all about that. Um, and then of course we see, I, I don't know that it would surprise anyone in this room sort of who the laggards are in terms of women's representation at the bottom sort of low participants on the courts. Um, but I will say that there is, of course, significant variation across the region. Not all of the Middle East and North Africa region is at a zero. That um, top piece of the bar, this is um, Lebanon, is what my note's going to tell me. It's going to be Lebanon, and I'm not going to remember what the percentage number is off the top of my head. I got pretty far through. Um, and the slide's not going to tell me. Um, and then we also see some of these other cases of variation. And I think the story of the variation within the region is kind of masked by that previous one. That, yeah, some of the West looks good on average, but we've still got countries where representation is down below 10%. Um, given that I have a couple of minutes left, let me plug the other project. So this is the data. We're hopeful that we are hopeful the book man, the two papers will be out the rest of the semester. And then the um, book manuscripts will hopefully go under review in the spring, and at that point in time, we're gonna post the data on our website. We are also working with the um, International Association of Women Judges, who has been super excited to have this data collected and is super excited for us to link it to their website. So we, we intend to do some dissemination efforts with them. But at this point, after this consuming three plus years of four people's lives, we'd like at least one article um, before we let- You can put me down as a review. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, well, we back to the beginning. Um, so the other project in my little last couple minutes remaining, this is the book that Misha and I have written on women's representation on, uh, in presidential cabinets, where we collected data on the backgrounds and um, experiences of these people. Um, a couple things I thought were really exciting to, and interesting to highlight from this book were um, the variation in presidential cabinets. The two bars in pink are the two female presidents we have in our data set. Um, Michelle Bachelet in Chile and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner in Argentina. And I think one of the interesting things here is there's not always this assumption that women pull along more women, that Michelle Bachelet commits to a parity cabinet and she has a pretty good job. Cristina Fernandez had no sort of stated commitment at the outset and in her first term she appoints only 20% women. At the same time, we look at Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, and the United States and we don't look terribly hot as a country. So that was a little sad for me working on this project. Um, one of the other things we, we, we do in the book is we look at the backgrounds of all of these. We scraped data off bios, books, news reports. We liked Wikipedia by the end of this project. <laughs> we loved people who were self-promoters on Wikipedia by the end of this project. Um, 
and collected background experience on portfolios and what they did and where they were assigned. And one of the things that I want to highlight, I want to flip through these graphs a little quickly, is that there's not a lot of significant differences between the men and the women. This is an extreme filter. And the women who get through this filter look an awful lot like the men. The women who get to the very top are, they've gone to many of the same kinds of elite law schools. They've gone to some of the same backgrounds. They are linked in. Um, our big finding, I think, and Misha may want to correct me, is that they're less likely to come from the business sector. They're less likely to be your, your Fortune 500 CEOs. But otherwise, they're linked in. They're connected. They're, they're politicos in their own right. Um, so they're, they're, the t they're the same type you've gotten all along. I don't know that for better or for worse. Um, same kind of political skills. They had a lot of prior experience. The lack of any of these little doohickeys on the side means that there's no statistically significant, at any level, difference between the two. Um, the men are a little more likely to be this insider coding. Um, women more likely to be political families. Um, and then they're likely to be connected um, to groups in the same sort of way, again, except for this, men more likely to have business connections, women more likely to have connections to women's groups. Shocking, I know. Um, and then one of the things that this led us to find was that there's very little difference in outcomes, that women are equally successful by and large across the board. So in the sort of the second half of the book, um, we turn these background categories into an independent variable predicting success across a couple different measures, but I'm out of time. So I'd love to tell you the rest of the book or, you know, the book's out. That's terrific. <laughs> so awesome. awesome. Thank, Thank you so, you much. so much. Thanks, everybody. OK, Natalie, you're on. Great. I have a one pager going around. And then a map I'm going to reference and a pamphlet to the Women's Stats Project, which Dr. Valerie <laughs> Hudson started, um, and which data I use is right up here. Thank you. Some of you have asked what resources I use. Uh, I have a, a bind, this black binder. It's full of policy documents about women in transitional justice. Um, and then here are some research methods on women in war, women in transitional justice, including kind of the Bible on women and um, uh, reparations, which is another transitional justice method that I haven't started working on. Hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> great. Super excited to be here. We'll just go through super fast. Wonderful. OK. Why do we gather data, OK? OK, imagine that there's an issue that you really, really care about, and you just can't seem to convince people using anecdotes, using complaining or gossiping about that person, OK? <laughs> OK, if we can collect data on what we're looking at, if we can find a way to standardize the different units, it's no longer apple, oranges, kiwis, but they're all kiwis, okay? And then if we can package the data in this visually attractive, colorful, but simplistic enough um, method that policymakers would actually use, as the Women's Stats Project does, um, then we could actually get people to change their opinions, change the needle on our issue. Okay, looking here, this is the, the very famous, the signature scale, physical security of women's scale at the Women's Stats Project. And this includes um, five different variables on violence against women, physical violence. What do we not see? What color do we not see? Mm -hmm. We see no dark greens. We see no dark greens. Does that mean that Women's Stats lowers their standard and they take the dark greens out of the legend? What would that mean if women's stats did that? That we are not visionary and we are not feminist and that we don't deserve physical security and we don't believe that, okay? So we keep, we keep the most feminist part of the legend in and we expect the world to rise to our standards. We do not pull the world down. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, what are your dark greens? I'm gonna share with you some of mine today. Okay. Colombia is going through a peace process after 50 plus years of war. Very interesting case study because of enormously high rates of female combatants. 
numbers show at least one in every three combatants have been female, and women have been very drawn to FARC. Uh, Columbia is also an interesting case study because it has fully committed to a gender mainstream peace process. And within that peace agreement is a whole section of transitional justice. And within the transitional justice agreement is an entire section on truth commissions. So Columbia might just very well be the light greens to lead the way. We're not sure. We're not sure. But they're going to be end up uh, country 48 in our data set. And a, as soon as they conclude in about you four years from now, then we can let you know. OK, what's a truth commission? This is. Um, my personal definition, temporary national level fact-finding human rights body within a government tasked with investigating conflict or historical exploitation, uh, such as Canada, such as Mauritius, investigating slavery and um, forced children in residential schools. Um, two, definitively concluding the causes and consequences of the conflict or historical legacy. And three, proposing recommendations for different stakeholders and action for the government to pursue. This is the most famous truth commission, not the first, the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, led by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, this is where the witness would sit. Um, they would, they would um, sit or stand lower. Then you have the commissioners um, arranged like a judicial body. Okay, And then over here in black and white, we see members of the military actually reenacting the torture scenes so that loved ones could know what they went through and that commissioners could actually get the details of some of the things that happened behind the scenes. OK, what is a truth commission? Uh, it's an opportunity for a country to finally figure out what were the causes and consequences of what we just went through. Who are the victims? Where are they? What do they want? Who are the perpetrators? Where are they? What do they need to reintegrate to society? Is there a demand for justice or not? And what in the world do we do as a country moving forward? Do we rebrand? Do we need lots of structural injustice, et cetera? Uh, this is an advertisement to go to Librarius PRC. And if you see on the left, yes, that is rape happening. And what they're saying to this illiterate population is regardless of what violence you experience, there is a place for you. Come and let us hear your story and connect all the gaps that we understand what just happened. And if we understand what just happened better, there's a better chance that we can stop that cycle, that conflict trap that Paul Collier talks about. OK, truth commission. So depending on who you talk to, um, and there are whole papers on just what is the definition of a truth commission and why you should adopt my version, um, there are at least four different leading uh, data sets who code just truth commission. Um, some scholars find as few as 24. Other scholars find as high as 64, um, including Columbia. We will get to 48, according to our data set. Ongoing right now, which is really interesting, Nicaragua, Tunisia, Nepal, and Venezuela, and then proposed will be Spain to investigate the Marcos regime. Um, the very cutting edge five Balkan country regional commission. It is an experiment that's never been, been done before. Um, and we have students reaching out to um, diplomats who are going and trying to engage in those negotiations to see how we can be of service. And then Gambia and Colombia. And Venezuela has also just uh, proposed a truth commission. OK, so how do we gather data? OK, at our project, we follow very much the women's stats methodology. Why? Because that's how I was trained. <laughs> um, and, and because it makes sense, it makes sense. We're not complaining, we're not gathering anecdotes, but we're actually taking social science qualitative data and we're putting it through a process, a scientific big process to end up with policy recommendations in the end. And this is how we do it. Uh, we collect the data, we translate the data, and yes, the students at Brigham University speak the languages of these post post-conflict countries. If I need Albanian, Nepalese, French speakers, I have them. If I need Korean speakers, it is amazing. Um, we code the data. We triangulate the data, just like women's stats, um, which means we find the data in at least three different sources that are um, independent of each other and all three credible. Okay, um, And sometimes we find the data in many more sources. Um, and then we take a second team and we repeat that process. So we have coded several countries several times through to literally scrape everything on the internet and then eventually we go to interviews if we need to. Okay, now I'm thrilled to tell you who is doing this work and how we can embed students, um, young activists, potential interns, potential research assistants at your universities into this entire process. And I'm gonna do that by showing you two different attempts to collect data, both with amazing students. OK, in our first attempt, I, uh, pathetic me with no research budget, um, just stood up in class and said, would anyone be interested in having a women, peace, and security research group? And we can just study women, peace, and security from the 1950s until today. Perhaps maybe just a, you know five, six weeks. Every week, we'll just study a different decade, just purely to learn. Students volunteered. They weren't getting credit. 
paid and they weren't getting paid and they volunteered. And so we started meeting together after class and talking about the different stakeholders. And they got so invested in their stakeholder, they actually followed the same stakeholder for every single decade. Uh, I was so impressed with them. Um, by the end of a few weeks, though, they said, we really need a way to visualize all the data we're not finding. We need to figure out um, how to visualize what's actually happening on the ground. And if we can't visualize that, then, then that means that something's happening. We have to do something with that. And so, can you go back? And so we uh, looked at all the different organizations, and some of your organizations are listed here, um, including uh, in, uh, the Institute for Inclusive Security. We talked about, so who are the stakeholders? Who actually has women, peace, and security data if we were to build a scale and fill it? So then we went through and we, thank you, and we designed a 21-point scale with um, national level variables, including the micro uh, level variables and UN level variables. And what we learned, uh, you don't even see the micro level variables here. Those are variables like how many women are leading um, civil resistance movements, how many women are leading um, uh, NGOs that are pro or against peace, how many women are involved in behind the scenes lobbying, even if they're not the named person at the table. And is that data available? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh, we were so naive. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just looking at that list and going, I've tried for decades to get data on some of this. <laughs> wow. So we pulled out all the micro-level variables, and they said, OK, what at least about national-level and UN-level variables? And we consulted yours truly, and yours truly said that this could, this could be more than a PhD thesis. And so at that point, we said, you know what? Is there anything we can do just to get this idea of a scale out? We researched what was, what was on the market. There are two, uh, two scorecards. One is by um, WIIS. Um, and the other is by Peace Women. Um, and although they, they do really interesting work, um, one is only on five countries, one is on 10 countries. And we wanted something around the area of 176 countries so that we could actually do perhaps regression someday with um, the women's stats data because their N is 176. Uh, so in the end, we, I had students go to conferences and they presented this. Um, an editor said, you know what? put your failed attempt into a book project, um, and they actually published a chapter. So here's two students that got a co-authoring opportunity um, writing a chapter about our failed attempt. And the auditor authors really helped us spin it in the direction of, this is a failed attempt because our national statistical bureaus and because uh, micro-level actors, they're not tracking what's super important. And so they hope that we make a contribution. OK, and if you're interested in the uh, three other attempts, I can show them to you. Um, since it went to publication, Georgetown's also come out with its own women, peace, and security scale um, with an N of 153. Uh, um, I think it's also problematic for, for, some of the, uh, for some reasons, and we can talk about that if you want. OK, here is our second attempt, our second attempt at getting data. So as a, as a lawyer, as someone who cares about gender and development, where gender law and development come together for me, for me, it's transitional justice and rule of law, okay? How to help a country um, transition better out of conflict to hopefully avoid that conflict trap uh, from Paul Collier. Oh. And in uh, December of 2016, I sent out feelers again saying, I have no research budget and I can't offer you extra credit, but is anyone interested in studying transitional justice, which was not taught at my university? And actually a few students said yes. So when I had three students, I thought, okay, this isn't bad. Um, and I actually went to my boss, who's such an, um, I'm so grateful, such a, a feminist and really believes in my work. And he's like, Natalie, yeah, you can make that a class. So I kid you not, in 48 hours, this class was approved. It usually takes a year. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was able to formally recruit students. And we met as a research uh, team um, at least once a week. And what we did is we would take one country every week. We would divide up the different uh, variables on gender, uh, participation and also gender inclusivity and then outcomes in the final report on gender, gender at all of three stages of a truth commission. Um, we studied 14 countries the first semester. We started with about 20 variables. I was teaching them the best of what I knew of scaling, which wasn't that much uh, because I, I, um, I, I didn't build any scales while I was at the Women's Stats Project. I still want that training. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and this is what we learned. Personally, I learned students enjoy tricky problems. They love charting new ground. They love not having a structured assignment or a structured answer, but actually building the curriculum as the semester went forward. Um, students can also design variables. 
And if they get the right training, which eventually I learned to give them, students can build scales. They can build scales. Um, and that was phenomenal. OK, what did the students learn? They learned to gather data. They learned to translate data online, if, even if they don't speak the language, or get really savvy and hunt out volunteers on campus. Um, they learned to do data management. Um, they built different versions of their scale. They had to prototype it. They had to run a few countries through. They had to workshop it at, 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 a, at a poster session for a mentored research uh, class. They got practice as if they were a PhD student in academia. So they're walking away with lots of different PhD skills. OK, our end product is we exploded to 100 variables, several spreadsheets. We have a, a data bank of contacts in country and then a relationship with the creativity innovation design space at Brigham University. So every semester, we've been uh, very grateful to win the opportunity to host our mentored research class inside that design facility. And they literally give us 360 degree dry erase boards, um, $6,000 screens that, that we don't need, but that we can Skype Colombians in when we want to do um, some of the, the feedback. OK. We have so many variables, and there's so much to learn about a truth commission. Eventually, we divided the data into three parts. The design phase is when, hopefully, women and men, civil society and government groups together are crafting the mandate. Hopefully, um, not just females and men, but also people of various ethnicities, races, religions, and victims, which is so unique. You hardly ever see a victim on a truth commission. What does a truth commission do? It collects hundreds of thousands of statements of human rights abuses, OK? Um, during the design phase, we see the hiring of staff. We see training of staff. Hopefully, there's gender trainings, gender sensitivity training for those who are taking statements. OK, during the operations phase, that's when the public phase of a commission opens. That's when um, the written, the oral, the Qualtrics statements are actually gathered. That's when we have to provide physical security, identity security. The final report is when all the statements are finally compiled and written. OK, well, I have not shown you any results. <laughs> um, this, um, yeah, th these are pictures of the students applying human-centered design, building their scales, workshopping them. Um, and then these are, some of our, these are some of our outcomes. We went from 100 to 300 variables. And can you go to this slide? OK, and what we, what we learned is that we have become kind of like a think tank. And we have people in Colombia and Ireland who are now requesting data. We, we can't keep up with the demands. Um, but the students have, um, they're now co-authoring uh, three academic articles, um, three encyclopedia entries. We have four policy documents going to Colombia. And we had a 70-person simulation where we actually worked people through five different rooms. And that is the climax of human-centered design. Human-centered design says you get better policy or better product if you use empathy, uh, if you get the feedback loop with the person, if you prototype and design, and then if you actually test it out. And so if any of you want to see results across any of the three phases, um, let me know. And then I'd love your ideas as to how this would be helpful. Would randomized control trials be helpful? And if so, I need to get the permissions um, of, of the Colombian government to do that. Would it be helpful to continue to do regressions? Um, is, Gen, or do gender units or women appointed during the design phase, um, does that translate into better policy outcomes at the second and third stage? Or there's a host of other things we could do. So I'd love your feedback. Thank you. Wow. OK. Um, I'm tired. I'm just exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> When I think of all the person years that have gone into the collection of the data on women in cabinets, <laughs> women on high courts, and now gender and transitional justice, uh, I'm uh, overwhelmed. <laughs> um, and so um, I am mindful of our, unfortunately, we have time constraints. So this is what I'm going to do. Knowing that you, those of you who are in the room are committed human beings, I'm going to say, Let's let Olivia sum everything up. Our, and our, oh my gosh. I must really be tired. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We're going to let Jackie try to sum up our entire day. Good luck. And then um, I thought what we could do is since we're, we're then going to have the, uh, uh, a little reception before we go to dinner, 
let's talk to these incredible women who have uh, women who've created these data sets and uh, see you know where we could take this further because this is really amazing stuff uh, and then um, I, I do want to uh, encourage you um, the before you leave you, you know I feel really bad that we've flown you into Texas and never let you really see Texas right you know is at least I want you to go uh, yeah we have the blue bonnets in the and the boots somewhere don't we is at least I want you to go out and I want you to walk around the sculpture that's in front of the presidential uh, conference center if you've never seen it uh, it reminds me not only of what it's supposed to be about which is the breaking down of the Berlin Wall you'll see horses jumping over the Berlin Wall these are the horses that came down. but it seems to me that what we've had today is sort of a similar feeling that we are starting to break down these barriers right whether we're talking about the policy world whether we're talking about a lack of data, uh, uh, whether we're talking about a lack of interest, we're starting to break down those walls too. So that sculpture for me is very meaningful in terms of what, uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's give the panel uh, applause and then we'll have Jackie come up. Good, great, great job, you too. Uh, you're very welcome, dear.